Hello, my name is Amy Case. I'm a physician who chairs the Department of Palliative and Supportive Care at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Today, we will be discussing how to have goals of care and advanced care planning discussions with our patients. My objectives for this talk are to first look at three aspects of palliative care. To name two differences between palliative care and hospice. To list two barriers to discussing prognosis in patients with advanced illness. To explain REMAP and some of the other ways that we may go about having a goals of care discussion in the outpatient setting. Spikes is another method that we may use to disclose serious news. I'm going to go over something called the Serious Illness Conversation Guide and I'm going to provide the guide to you in this talk. I have nothing to disclose. I'm going to talk about a case of a 54-year-old white female. She unfortunately has stage 4 non-small cell lung cancer that's metastatic to her bone and lymph nodes. She has a pleural fusion, a pulmonary embolism, and recurrent hypercalcemia of malignancy. She recently was in the intensive care unit with delirium, hypercalcemia, and post-obstructive pneumonia due to obstructing lung mass. Her functional status is good and she's ambulatory. She has shortness of breath with minimal exertion, pleuritic chest pain and cough, and she's interested in chemotherapy and radiation. The patient's married, she has two adult children who are pretty supportive. I'm going to ask a few questions and I'm hoping you could think about how you would answer this. The first question is, what do you feel her prognosis is and predictable course? The second question is, what will cause her deterioration and ultimate demise and death? What is to be expected? And the third question is, what should be discussed with this patient and family? So to answer the first question, you may look at the case and think that someone with post-obstructive pneumonia, hypercalcemia and delirium, all are pointing to something that could be considered a negative prognosis. Given that stage four non-small cell lung cancer is a chronic disease these days, treated with targeted therapies that work off, often very well for patients, she still has several concerning symptoms that would lead me to feel that she would need an advanced care planning discussion and that she might potentially have recurrent hypercalcemia, another pneumonia, or to decline in the coming months. And definitely within the next year, I wouldn't be surprised if this woman were to decline. She certainly would be eligible once her mental status cleared for radiation and for chemotherapy and possibly immunotherapy. What will cause her deteri deterioration or death? I would be concerned that her obstructing lung mass may cause respiratory issues or a recurrent pneumonia in the near future. She also is at risk for having her calcium go up again and also having delirium. And so these things are likely to recur and that could lead to her demise. So talking about what's important to her if she ever got sicker or if she ever had respiratory distress would be important. And so therefore it's important to discuss with the patient and family what her goals of care would be if she ever became sicker. I'm going to talk a little bit during this discussion with you about how we have these advanced care planning discussions when we're seeing somebody in our cancer clinics. What is palliative care? Palliative care is not hospice. However, the two overlap. Often people confuse the two. Patients might receive palliative care along with aggressive care. Hospice is for those patients who have given up aggressive care and have chosen to focus on comfort usually at home in the last six months of life. Palliative care is given anytime for a patient with a history of chronic advanced illness. It may overlap with hospice, and we often refer to hospice. Palliative care doesn't mean you have to elect for a do not resuscitate. You do not have to give up aggressive treatments or therapies. Aggressive therapy, such as chemo, radiation, and other procedures can still be given when someone is receiving palliative care. Often, this, this word palliative has a stigma in the community, and many patients are afraid. They think that it might mean that we're giving up on them or we're sending them to hospice. As physicians, I think it's important to clarify that with them. Patients still may be able to have workups and other interventions in the hospital. They can re remain a full code, and it's ideal for all patients to have a healthcare proxy documented and to partake in advanced care planning discussions 
which we'll again get into during this lecture. On this slide, I have uh, a schematic about the models of palliative care. Maybe about 15, 20 years ago, patients would receive life prolonging care. They would become sick and in the very end of life, usually the last month or so, they might be referred to hospice and then pass away. Nowadays, um, it's preferred that patients are seen by palliative care services while they're receiving their prolonging, uh, life prolonging care and as time goes on, the palliative care might increase and the life prolonging care may decrease because it might be burdensome on the patient and by the end of life, they would be referred to hospice and you can see that they're being referred earlier. And then afterwards, if the patient passes, they would receive bereavement support. The definition of palliative care is that it's total care of patients with advanced disease or chronic illness with distressing symptoms. It can be pain or non-pain symptom management, paying attention to the physical symptoms. It can be attention to the psychological, social, and spiritual aspects of care as well. And it's generally a team approach. One physician or one provider cannot provide palliative care on their own. Our goal is to improve the quality of life for patients and their families. We prefer patients to be referred to us sooner, and if that happens, we can uh, help them get through some of their aggressive treatments while they're undergoing those. Here's another diagram of all of the different things that pal a palliative care team might be able to do for a patient. We tend to treat the whole person, so over here we have the holistic approach. We tend to focus on the quality of life. We also talk a lot about healthcare planning, planning and what to expect if the, the disease progresses and how to plan in case of the worst. And then we focus on difficult to treat physical and emotional symptoms. We always include the families in the care of the patient. When is it time to refer to our service? Anyone who has an advancing stage of cancer with a progression, progression on treatment generally would be someone that we would think about referring. Someone who has difficult, difficult to control physical or emotional symptoms, several comorbid medical or psychiatric issues, assistance with tough goals of care discussions, or somebody who isn't quite ready to talk about these things. Somebody who has complex family dynamics or care, caregiver stress, Maybe a patient who lives far away and has difficulty coordinating care or getting to the hospital. Maybe if you're not sure if somebody would be eligible for hospice, you could refer to palliative care first and we could help you figure that out. The question to ask yourself is would you be surprised if your patient died in the next year? If you're not, if you wouldn't be, then it would be a good idea to maybe ask us for our opinion to help out. Early palliative care has been shown in some studies to improve survival in advanced cancer patients. There's one study that was a randomized controlled trial put out by the New England Journal of Medicine in those with advanced lung cancer, and those patients lived on average three months longer, and they had a better quality of life and less depression. And there was another study put out uh, that was a randomized controlled trial looking at survival of immediate versus delayed palliative care involvement and those patients who had earlier palliative care involvement had a 15% improval of their one-year survival, and that was in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. Many patients do not discuss their goals of care with their clinicians. Fewer than one-third of patients with end-stage medical diagnoses discussed end-of-life preferences with their physicians. Patients with advanced cancer had their first end-of-life discussion occurring about 33 days prior to death. 55% of initial end-of-life discussions occurred in the hospital. And often these conversations fail to address key elements of what really needs to be discussed. Sometimes if we give seriously ill treatments that we often give those who aren't seriously ill, it may harm them and their families. Aggressive care for patients with advanced illness is harmful. It can lower pe people's quality of life. It can cause physical and psychological distress. For caregivers, many of them have major depression, and some studies have shown that caregivers have a higher rate of major depression than the patients themselves. They have a lower satisfaction with being a caregiver and quality of life. And 
this has been, this is the reason why uh, palliative care interventions are helpful because we can talk about the benefits and the burdens of some of these treatments with their patients. It's important to start conversations about goals of care and benefits and burdens with patients and families early. This helps enhance goal concordant care. What is important to that patient? Time to make informed decisions and fulfill personal goals. If they have something that they really want to get done and they know their prognosis and what to expect, then it's easier for them to fulfill these goals. It improves their quality of life when they have knowledge about what's going on and it improves patient satisfaction. Another benefit is that patients may choose to elect for hospice care at home much earlier and therefore benefit from the, the wonders that hospice can give them when they're close to the end of their lives instead of being in the hospital connected to a machine, for example. This can maybe lead to fewer hospitalizations in general and we can get people help in the home as an alternative. Patients and families tend to cope better when they know about things as they're coming and what to expect as the disease progresses. It can also lead to eased burden of decision making for families later on when decisions fall on the family rather than the patient. After the patient passes away, outcomes after they die can be improved. Grieving may be easier. The American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, has clinical practice guidelines that were put in place in 2016. What they said in an essence is inpatients and outpatients with advanced cancer should receive dedicated palliative care services early in the disease course, concurrent with active treatment. Referral of patients to interdisciplinary palliative care teams is optimal and services may complement existing programs. Providers may refer patient and friend caregivers of patients with early or advanced cancer to palliative care services. There's many different advanced directives out there. And how do we know the differences between them? Sometimes that can get a bit confusing. Some patients may say to me, well, I have a living will. I met with my attorney, so I'm all set. So I'm going to just briefly review the differences between all the different advanced directives, at least in New York State. A healthcare proxy is when a patient assigns a surrogate to help make, make decisions for them if they're not able to make decisions on their own. And this is done by a patient with two witnesses, but it also could be done in an attorney's office. Durable power of attorney is done in an attorney's office, and what that does is they help make financial decisions for patients. A living will is done in an attorney's office, and it's a document stating someone's wishes, if they ever were to get sicker, generally worded that they wouldn't want to have undue suffering if they had a disease that was incurable and terminally ill. Unfortunately, if someone signs a living will in their attorney's office, that does not translate to what's done to us in the hospital or in our clinics with our medical providers. It's really important to fill out something called a MOLST, which is a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. This MOLST, which is in essence an order for a do not resuscitate, and other medical treatments are addressed on that form, is very important. It needs to be completed, in, at least in New York State, and several other states have versions of this called a POLST. And what this says is it tells uh, the physicians taking care of the patient what the patient would want if they ever became sicker down the road. It, in general, it states their end-of-life wishes. And when we have discussions with patients, we, I tend to put the MOLST away, and I have a discussion with my patient. But at the end of the day, I have to still fill out a MOLST in order to make sure my patient's wishes are followed. So it is important to do these forms. I'm going to talk a bit about prognostication. Often in medical school and residency, we're not really taught what prognostication is or how to do it. We generally just pick up things along the way. Prognostication is a learned skill that involves both evidence-based medicine and the art of medicine. Palliative care providers are pretty good at this. This is what we do. We have to prognosticate our patients well in order to figure out what how to counsel them and how to direct them when it's time to talk about tough decisions and things like hospice or treatments. It requires synthesis of several things. We look at disease trajectories, we look at symptoms, biomarkers, and then also communication is a really important part of prognostication. In general, patients and caregivers want a discussion about these topics. They want to negotiate the content of and the extent of what the information is given to them. As the disease progress, progresses, caregivers often want more information. Patients 
on the other hand, often want less. When a patient is, is asked about this, they often prefer a health professional who they trust, who shows empathy and honesty, who encourages questions, who understands what they're going through. And that's really important. How do we show our patients that we are listening to them? What are the barriers of communicating prognosis to our patients? Some providers might feel that patients should be told the truth, but in practice, many avoid or withhold. There's a concern that if they're incorrect, that the patient will lose confidence in them. There's a fear that taking away a patient's hope or faith might happen. The uncertainty of what is to come. There's, when we're talking about prognosticating patients, we don't really ever know for sure, but we can make good guesses, educated guesses about what might happen to that person, but it's uncertain. It's the gray area of medicine. A lack of training. No time to attend to the emotional needs that might ensue if you start talking about tough things. Stress. Requests from family to withhold information. Don't tell my mom that this is going on. It's going to upset her. It's going to take away her hope. Some providers might feel that they ha they're inadequate or it's just hopeless um, to talk about these things. There's a nice mnemonic called the nurse which goes over how to empathize with people. And when I talk to fellows and residents and, and train them on how to have communication with their patients in an empathetic way, these are some of the things that, that we try to have them do. The first thing is, is naming, um, naming the emotion. So that means we actually have to pay attention to what our patient's response is, to what we're saying. If we're focused on our own agenda and getting out the information and talking at them, Often we miss all of the emotion in the room, which might be anger, which might be sadness. And so it's important to look at the patient and try to figure out what is going through their mind. The most important thing is to actually uh, name the emotion and actually reflect back to that patient what you think is going on. It sounds like you're frustrated. Understanding. This helps me understand what you're thinking. So maybe repeating something again or explaining why you're asking something a certain way. Respecting. Telling a patient that you respect how well they've been following your instructions. Supporting. I will do my best to make sure you have what you need. Or exploring. Could you say more about what you mean when you say this? There's a, a video that's, that talks about goals of care discussions in clinic. What I heard you say is that if we could give you more antibiotics and get you home, you'd like to live at home as long as you can. Yes, I want to stay at home. And I also heard you say that you don't want to be stuck on a machine. Hmm. Yeah, when it's my time to go, I want to go peacefully. May I make a recommendation? Sure. We ought to keep you on the treatments you're on now and try to get you home. There's a good chance that will work. And once you're at home, we should focus on keeping you at home. Yeah, that sounds good. If you got worse and had to be put on machines, I don't think I could get you off them. So I don't think we should do that. Does that sound right? Yes. So how do we go about having these discussions with a patient who is facing advancing illness? One, one way that people talk about is something called ask, tell, ask. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You explore a little bit with the patient what they already know, then you may tell them a bit about what you know, and they ask what they understood about what you told them. You always have to ask a patient how much do they wish to know, because somebody might not really be in the mindset to be hearing bad news. It's important to ask if it's okay to give an estimated prognosis. Is this something a patient wants to know? And if so, it's important for us to give that. And the way I sometimes do this is that I say, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if in the X amount of time you, you got sicker. Another phrase that's helpful is knowing that you may have a short time left, where would you want to spend that time? Where would you want to be? And what's important to you during that time? If a goal is to be home and comfortable, it's important to then make a recommendation to allow things to happen naturally at home. 
And that's actually a do not resuscitate order. And that's when you would pull out your MOLS form and you would fill it out. And if, if, it's, if it's indicated, refer someone for home hospice. So I included a video um, put out by someone named Atul Gawande, who you may have heard of, and it's a pretty nice video that pretty much sums up in about three minutes everything I just said. And it's pretty eloquent, so I'll have you take a look at that. These are hard conversations. I've blown them many times myself. I've not known what to do. And with this study coming out from the Mass General where the patients had seen a palliative care physician, I realized what the, that the gain they'd gotten was that really they'd seen six people who knew how to, that, that's the staff at the Mass General for palliative care, that they'd seen one of these six people who knew how to talk to them about the end of life. And so what I did was I went to those doctors and just said, I'm really bad at this. If you had to make a little list for me of what it is that I should talk about with people facing these problems, what would you put on that list? One of the doctors that I spoke to was a palliative care physician at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute named Susan Block. And Susan encapsulated it, I thought, the best for me, at least in a way that I could use. She said that there were four things that she has as a little mental list in her head that she wants to talk about with a patient who's terminally ill. Number one, do they know their prognosis? Number two, what are their fears about what is to come? Number three, what are their goals? What would they like to do as time runs short? And fourth, what are the trade-offs they're willing to make? How much suffering are they willing to go through for the sake of the possibility of added time? That list was really interesting to me. It was not a list asking, do you want a ventilator or do you not want a ventilator? as you come to the end. Do you want your heart shocked? Do you not want your heart shocked? Her point was, if you tell me the answers to those questions, I can make a recommendation to you that says, you would not want this toward the end if these are your goals. Our misconception is that the conversation is about hard choices. Really, it's a conversation about asking people about what they want to look forward to as time run short and what they fear the most. And the second misconception is that it's a, that, that arriving at what we want at the end is a kind of epiphany. Sign here, do you want hospice, do you not want hospice? It's not an epiphany, it's a process. It's a series of conversations and ups and downs as we go through a very hard uh, series of um, uh, sequence of things that happen to you as you become ill and, and have things come to an end. Atul Gawande and Ariandi Labs put together a training module called the Serious Illness Conversation Guide. And I'm including this for you. And what this is, is a script. Now, is it really a great idea to read off a script when we're talking to our patients? No, it's not. But if you're new at this and you're uncomfortable about having these discussions, this might be a way to look at what's important to address in these discussions. And maybe before you go in with a patient or practicing it with them by asking permission for you to read some of the questions off of there, and certainly going off script it would not be something that would be terrible, would be a good idea. And so looking at this really quickly, they give some ideas about how to lead this discussion. They talk about setting up, they talk about access, so how much information would you want to know, asking how much the patient would like to know, and then sharing. Sharing information about prognosis. And then under the explore category, it talks a bit about what's important to that patient, if their situation ever worsened, what are their fears and worries, if they were to become sicker, what gives them strength as they think about the future, what abilities are so critical to their li life that they can't imagine living without them. And that's a really important question. So often I'll say, you know, how much are you willing to go through as far as suffering for the benefit of potentially gaining added time? And in some of these patients, it might be a real small amount of time that they're, they're gaining, but that might be worth it to them. 
and how much does their family know about their priorities and wishes? And it's important to, important to at first invite um, anyone that the patient may want in these meetings to discuss these things along with the family. And then at the end is to close. It sounds like blank is very important to you. It sounds like being at home and being comfortable is important to you and to be cognitively intact. You want to be able to spend time with your family if you're getting sicker. Given your goals and priorities about your illness and your wishes, I would recommend that we focus on treating your cancer, but if the treatments aren't effective anymore and you're becoming sicker, if you prefer to be home, I would recommend we complete something called a do not resuscitate and we focus on things going naturally at home. We're in this together. And so then after we would do this, we would sit down and document a goals of care discussion. And I could talk a bit later about what that entails. I have another video that goes over how to disclose serious news. And this is put out by Vital Talk. So I wonder if it would be OK if we went over your test results now. Sure, yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. To make sure we're on the same page, remind me your understanding of why we're doing the why we do these every three months. Oh, just to kind of do a general sort of make sure everything's okay. Perfect. Right? Okay. And so we got all, we looked at all the tests from last that you got yesterday. Great. And they're all normal except Great. for one. Except for one, the alkaline phosphatase, which is a test that we do to look at your bone and at your liver. Okay. Now I can see that you're looking sort of like, oh, what does that mean? Yeah. And I have to tell you, I'm not really sure what it means. It's a sort of, it's not a very accurate test, so it sort of often picks up noise. It is that it, it's abnormal even when you're normal. And so it's a kind of test that sort of gets me to say, oh, I need to do more tests rather mm -hmm. than, oh, I'm concerned. Okay, I but no big deal. It means that I need to do more tests. We need to do a CAT scan and we need to do a bone scan, so it's some more of your time. And yet it's the kind of thing that I think we, I don't know whether it's a big deal and we're just going to have to see what the other tests show. More like a precaution. More like a precaution. So are you okay with the plan of just getting the test and then coming back? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's do it that way. Common missteps. Getting off track. The order of questions is pretty important. And so it's really important to actually follow the guide if you're going to be using that as a script in order. Because one question may prompt an answer that will help you on later on in the discussion. The topics addressed may not feel right at first, and it's often best to just have your own style and revert to what you're comfortable uh, with. However, you can really get off track if you don't go back to the script and remind yourself that you really have to address certain major priorities with the patient. And then just remember that the first priority is to always learn what the patient's values and goals are. Resist the urge to provide premature reassurance oh, I don't think that anything's going to happen right now or for a really long time. Um, so I think we're, we're, we're fine. I'm just bringing this up just in case. Those things are okay to say. However, it might provide a false sense of hope or a false sense of security to a patient who is actually getting very ill quite rapidly. So it's important to be honest in a compassionate way. Talking more than listening is often something that physicians and providers may do. Sitting back and asking an open-ended question and then listening to the answer is often really important. Using medical jargon. So it's often important to just tell a patient something in a very simple way, not use big words, and then see what they understand. And then avoid addressing the emotions. When someone starts to cry, often we want to just run out of the room. <laughs> At least uh, I've seen many other of my colleagues have that issue. Um, but I think it's important to give a helping hand to our patients who are feeling sad or angry and not to let that get us down. Often we can offer a tissue or a hand on their shoulder or even give a hug just to address what that emotion might be. But in a helpful statement to say, I see that you're really sad. I wish this wasn't happening. Here's a four minute video talking about family conferences and it, I think it's very helpful and it's a clinician guide on how to have a, a family uh, meeting. Family Conferences for Serious Illness, a Clinician's Guide. 
your patient is seriously ill. You call a family conference to talk about code status. You tell them that the medical situation is very serious. You ask, given his tenuous status, if his heart stops, should we do CPR? The family thinks he could still pull through. You say, but what if he doesn't make it? What then? The wife gets angry and tells you, you can't predict the future. You don't know what to say. You feel stuck. The family wants a miracle you can't deliver. Meanwhile, you're worried that the patient is suffering. You can do better. A good family conference can get everyone on the same page, ensure that they understand the medical situation, and bring the family and team together to choose treatments that match the patient's values. Here are seven steps that make family conferences better. Pre-meet, introduce, assess, update, empathize, prioritize, and align. Step one, pre-meet. Before you sit down with the family, get your team together. Make sure you are all on the same page about the medical situation, that you share what you know about the family, and try to agree on some key points. Step two, introduce. Hold the conference in a place that affords some privacy. Start with introductions, then explain the purpose of the meeting. Step three, assess. Assess the family's perspective so that you can build a shared understanding. You can say, so that I know where to begin, what have you heard already about his condition? Step four, update. When you update the family, Give information in parts rather than one long lecture. Use language they can understand. Pause to let the family ask questions. And finish with a big picture. Overall, his medical situation is worse. Step five, empathize. When families understand the information you're giving, they often react with emotions. At that point, instead of giving more information, acknowledge the emotion. For example, if you notice they're sad, you could say, I can see you're really concerned about him. Then pause to see how they react. Often, acknowledging an emotion makes people feel understood and it helps them process information. Step six, prioritize. Try to elicit the patient's values. Use this question. Could you tell me about him as a person? What's important to him? After you've heard the answer, then ask, if he could talk to us now and knew what the doctors thought about his medical condition, what would he say? Asking the family to put themselves in the patient's shoes is usually easier for them than asking them to make a decision that they may see as life or death. Step seven, align. If the family can talk to you about the patient's values, align the medical care plan with those values. If the family is unsure or uncertain, you can offer to make a recommendation. Explain that your recommendation is based on what you know about the patient's values and the medical situation. Sometimes different family members hold different views. In that case, give each person some airtime for their views and feelings and try not to take sides. Many families will accept a care plan if they feel that you are trying to honor the patient's values and are dealing with the reality of the medical situation. But they find these discussions hard, so make sure you and your team offer some support. When you're done, be sure to document the conference in the medical record. When the meeting is over, how do you evaluate your work? Here's our definition of success. The family leaves saying, I got to say what's important to me, and they listened. The team understands what we're going through. They care about us. We'll make the best of it. The doctor leaves saying, I feel better because these medical treatments match his values. And by building my skills, I feel more equipped for these tough situations. Some family conferences are more complicated and you cannot always come to an agreement. For these situations, you'll need another level of skill. But these seven steps will get you off to a good start. You can find more at vitaltalk.org. When I'm having these discussions with patients, I often ask them, what do you expect will happen? I often try to reassure them that DNR, or do not resuscitate, does not mean do not treat. And instead of saying do not, you might say, we're, all, we're going to allow things to happen naturally. 
So instead of using negative language, we're using positive language. Focusing on the things that you will do for the patient. They often respond a lot better to that. We're not going to restart your heart if it happens to stop because that is likely to not be effective for you if you're very sick. But what we will do for you is we will make sure you're comfortable, we'll treat your pain, and you won't be gasping for air. We'll make sure of that. Making a recommendation is really important. One way to say this is, we've agreed that the goal of care is comfort and you pre prefer to be at home. With this in mind, I do not recommend CPR or life support. When your heart stops and you have died, we'll, let just, we'll just let it go naturally at home. Another example is, given the severity of your illness, CPR would in all likelihood not be effective. Based on your expressed goals for quality of life, I would recommend that you choose not to have it. But we would still continue all potentially effectable treatments for reversible issues. What do you think? I'm going to switch gears a bit. And the last part of this talk is about billing and getting reimbursed for having advanced care planning discussions. Advanced care planning, or ACP, has billing CPT codes. And certainly, these discussions take time. So we might as well get reimbursed and actually obtain RVUs for these, these discussions. Starting January 2016, Medicare is now reimbursing physicians for advanced care planning discussions. The first code, 99497, is what you would put in when you're having a discussion with a patient, explaining their advanced directives, reviewing forms such as MULST, and talking with them for at least 15 to 30 minutes. It's usually the, for the first 30 minutes. And it's in face to face, in person, with family members present usually. And if you look at this, the RVUs 2.4, and the reimbursement on average is around $75. And 99498 is each additional 30 minutes that you spend with a patient discussing goals of care, it would be the next level, which is actually an additional RVU of 2.09, which is an additional $70 on average reimbursement. If you look at reimbursements for bone marrow biopsies in the cancer population or other small procedures, it's, it's comparable. So these are often worthwhile to do for our patients and spending for the level, the level one, spending greater than 15 minutes but less than 45 minutes and for the level two, 45 minutes or more is how we would do this. These are the um, different reimbursements just to give you an idea of our local insurance carriers and what they pay for those code, uh, ACP codes. So how do we implement um, advanced care planning in our practices? You can have an advanced care planning discussion with any patient at any time, including the same time as their annual wellness visit, which you need to put a modif modifier 33 on it. You can attach it onto a sick visit, a transitional visit, or a chronic care visit. You may bill for repeated discussions over time. And as we know, people who do these discussions, it's not one discussion that seals the deal with the, this. Usually we have to talk to patients again and again. And when they hear this information, it takes them time to process that. So I think of this as a journey over time with the patient, not just a one-time discussion. And so we may have discussions every time we visit with somebody and bill for each one of those. You can bill up to one discussion per day. A patient may have a prior written documents such as a healthcare proxy or a living will. And if they do, you can address that in your documentation of an advanced care planning discussion. It's important to ask the patient and family to bring their prior written documents for your review. And usually I try to uh, talk about those and then transition them over to the MULS form. We use the Conversation Project Starter Kit, and here's the link to that. Um, that you can upload off the website. This is free and open access to every medical provider. If you, if you get copies of this conversation starter kit, you can hand them to your patients. They come in all the different languages. And what it does is helps patients and families work through some of their values and their beliefs and their preferences regarding having advanced illness. And most forms are very important to have on hand for when we have these discussions in order to fill them out at the end of the at the end of the discussion. Providers who may bill for an advanced care planning discussion include physicians, nurses, 
physician assistants, social workers, psychologists, certified diabetes educators, dietitians, nutritionalists, pharmacists, and respiratory therapists. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> this is important to know because we, in palliative care at least, use a team-based approach to our care. So um, our social workers and our nurses can help out with at least starting these discussions, but often a physician or a nurse practitioner are the ones that are filling out the MOLS form because the MOLS form does need to be signed by a licensed physician or nurse practitioner. But the documentation of having a discussion can be put in by any one of these um, providers. So what is the required documentation? What's really required is the patient, you have to document whether or not the patient has capacity to make decisions. Are they alert? Do they understand what's being discussed? And if not, who is the designated surrogate or healthcare proxy? Who is in attendance? Generally, it's you list the patient and whoever family members are present, as well as the names of the healthcare team and family. You describe what medical issues have brought you, led you to feel that a discussion is warranted today. And in my opinion, that prognosis should be addressed in every discussion note. However, with open charting, sometimes patients have access to read their own records. And if you don't feel comfortable disclosing prognosis in an open, honest way with your patient, you may not want to document it in the chart if you have not told them, to that, told them their prognosis verbally. But it is important to document that you have had a discussion about prognosis if it, it indeed was discussed. You want to ask the patient what type of medical care they prefer, their comfort level of what they prefer as they are to get sicker, how they prefer to be treated by others, and what the patient wishes to know. So I'm going to include an example of an advanced care planning note. When I write a note, I'll usually give a, a brief clinical summary of what's going on. It doesn't have to be long. Just state the diagnosis and maybe a few things about why you're having the discussion. In this case, this was a patient with lung cancer and she was having a functional decline with shortness of breath, weight loss, her capacity. So does she understand, is the delirium cleared? And does she fully understand what's going on and, and, and what, what you're talking to her about? So does she have capacity to make her own decisions or does she not? Consent. She prefers to know all the details regarding her illness, prognosis, and was in agreement to discuss her goals of care today. She's in agreement for her family to hear this information as well. So did the patient consent to have the discussion, yes or no? In attendance, who was there? She was joined by her husband, Tom, her son Dave, the team social worker, Jenny, is also present during the discussion. It's sometimes helpful to put last names, but in general, as long as you have first names, that's usually okay. Prognosis is optional, but I think important. If you talk to a patient about what, uh, what you expect about their illness, you should write it maybe in a way that you would not be surprised if that patient may become sicker in the next six months. This is an estimate. Someone could live longer than that. Someone could die sooner. And so we never really know for sure, but it is an estimate. She's eligible for hospice and cancer treatment has been deemed to be too burdensome. If you write these things in the record, it's very helpful for some of our colleagues to be able to decipher what the next steps are for the patient. And then outline the goals of care that you address with them. If time happens to be running short, the patient said that she prefers to spend time with her family and her dogs at home. She would choose to be pain free and not be placed on artificial life support at the end of life. She particularly said she would never want to live in a nursing home. And then the next step is to review the conversation toolkit with the family and get out the MOLS form and make a recommendation to the patient about filling out the form. And that's when you fill out a do not resuscitate based on what her goals of care are. You don't ask her if she would like to have her heart restarted once it stops. She already told you that she wouldn't want that. If we start asking that as a yes or no question, often patients might get confused and distracted. It's best to make a recommendation and just fill it out as a do not resuscitate. I do tell patients that I'm electing for them to be a do not resuscitate, and that is a DNR because that terminology is something that they may expect or not expect. And then it's very important at the end of the note to write the total time that was spent in addition to the clinical visit in face-to-face -face discussion. And in this case, we spent about 20 minutes. If you put this in, this would be a level one advanced care planning note. In summary, prognostication is both a science and an art. 
Physicians tend to be overly optimistic by a factor of about three to five when they're prognosticating patients. Ask yourself if you would be surprised if your patient died in the next year. If you weren't, it's important to discuss sooner rather than before the crisis hits. And maybe call your palliative care service sooner rather than later. Involve the family in meetings and discussions. Use the SPIKES protocol and give estimates of prognosis. Once they know the prognosis, review their goals of care. Once you know the goals, make a recommendation to the patient. Thank you.